1 John chapter 3. So like I told you before, here and there I'll be going through a series in Sunday school. I'll give you something very deep or I'll give you something basic. Uh, I hesitate to say the word basic though, you know, because we do learn from basics. And then intermediate, I'll cover various different topics. So today what I want to do is I, in the beginner's discipleship lesson, I'm not sure how many of you have watched that, but that is probably the most important lesson out of everything that I taught. Now, my favorite lesson is history, but the most important lesson is actually that beginner's discipleship because it covers theological studies. So every person, no matter what denomination you are, they want to study theology, which is basically the study of God, studying main important doctrines in the Bible. Majority, you might consider to be basic, but I do get amazed how much of the basic that I've learned and I missed out. So it's going to be important to try to pay attention and to write down notes or then keep, uh, keep them in your heart. And you'd be amazed that these simple things become the very foundations that will open up and make more sense of the deeper doctrines. Make more sense of why you believe in what you believe in why we say these words when we teach and preach. So if you uh, look at that uh, board over here, these are all the branches of theology that I covered in Beginner's Discipleship. What I want to do is videos that I was not able to post on these doctrines, I want to now do a video on those. A lot of people have been going to my audio recordings that I've sent them over to. Some of them are missing, so I'd like to refresh them. So I like to play catch up on some of the doctrines that have not been posted on video for these theological studies. In theological studies, there are several different branches. There's bibliology, which is the doctrine of the Bible. And then there are five lessons out of that. Then there's theology or theology proper, which is the doctrine of God. And then Christology, which is the doctrine of Christ. And obviously you can see from here, there's a lot from Christology. Then you see pneumatology, which is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this one is one of my favorites because the Holy Spirit is an active agent in our lives today. And if we were to apply them, we would see a lot more spiritual fruit. Then there is uh, anthropology. Anthropology is not like your typical secular class because they don't cover the fallen nature of man what the Bible says about the fallen nature of man. So anthropology, doctrine of man, amartiology, doctrine of sin. So this one is very convicting. So if you're going through things in your life where you want to learn about sin, this is probably going to be uh, one of your favorites. And then soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. Now you're going to hear these terms quite often from preachers and theologians or scholars. So these terms are pretty important for you to know. Soteriology is quite often mentioned because it has to do with our salvation. That's the doctrine of salvation there. And then we see right here Christianology, if such a word exists. But basically doctrine of Christians, studying uh, the life of Christians. And obviously there is so much to learn right here. Yeah. This is probably the most that you learn. Amen. Things what Christians can apply in their lives. And then there is, right over here, the final four, is ecclesiology, doctrine of the church. Uh, in online, unfortunately, this is probably the least known doctrine. So they need to go back to basics to learn ABC. That's the problem with a lot of people watching online is, I don't need to go to a local Bible-believing church. You know, I got online, then, you know, you don't know much about this doctrine. Angelology. Doctrine of angels, and that's like some deep stuff, obviously, which is pretty interesting. Demonology, uh, if you want to know about spiritual warfare, you want to know your enemies, then this is the doctrine for you to study. And then the one that's a big hit online, obviously, that everyone wants to get into is eschatology. That's a doctrine of end times, it's a lot of the stuff that you already heard about. And this doctrine is obviously the much deeper doctrine. 
So we are going to go through theology. Obviously, I'm not going to go through all of them. I've already posted videos on them, but the ones that I did not post videos, I want to cover. Maybe a few of them that I already posted videos on, I might review again, because it might be good. But we'll see what happens. But I want you to get an idea of what you're learning. So this is the best Bible study that you're ever going to get, is theology. All right, that is the most important for anybody, because once you know these doctrines, then it's going to make sense about a lot of the heresies out there. It's going to make sense a lot about your practical living, how you can apply it. It's going to make sense as you read your Bible. Some of these terms, doctrines are going to pop out and it'll click. So this is really good stuff. Really, really good stuff. Now, there are two books that I usually recommend, and that is Alvin Douglas's book, God's Answers to Man's Questions. That is inside our church library. And then the other one is uh, Dr. Upman's two volumes, Theological Studies, which is uh, the classic. It is a must. It is a must. I recommend everyone to buy those uh, three books. So today what we'll be talking about is one of the branches of hamartiology, doctrine of sin. So let's talk about sin today. All right. So today's doctrine will be on sin. So then, here's the idea is, uh, why do we say sin? You ever thought about that? It just comes in from our mind, into our minds that, well, it's pretty obvious. It means, you know, something really bad or wrong. But did you learn that from social norms? Or is there a good reason why you want to use that word sin? Because right now, today, a lot of people make light of the word sin. If you say that they've sinned or they're a sinner or that they're wicked, then they're going to get mad at you because everyone thinks that they're a good human being. So they make light of sin. There are things in this world that you say that's a sin, what you're watching is sin, what you're listening is sin, what you're doing is sin, and they're going to say, well, it's relative. How do you know? See, you can't go by Christian social norms. You have to know what the Bible says about it. So these things should have been basic, but we just glossed through them, right? And we just took it as a social norm and then just took it for granted. Yeah, that's a sin, that's a sin. But you want scripture for that. So that's the reason why these basic doctrines or theological studies are going to be very important so that you can have a verse, okay? Now, first of all, we use the term sin because obviously the meaning of sin, this is found in Webster's 1828 Dictionary, is the voluntary departure of a moral agent from a known rule of rectitude or duty prescribed by God. So in any voluntary transgression of the divine law. Now, the basic definitions for sin that you want to write down, if you want to write down or keep in mind, is that basically it's a violation of God's direct command. Now, when you think of it that way, then everybody sins. Everybody is wicked, not just a good person who messed up here and there, but wicked because wickedness uh, is defined within sin as a direct, deliberate violation of God's order, God's law, his rule. Another thing you want to keep in mind is that, like I mentioned before, wickedness, right? A wicked act. You call them a sinner, they might admit it. If you call them wicked... They'll hate you. Why not? It's the same thing. See? So wickedness is in line with sin. Iniquity is also in line with sin. So when you see these words in the Bible, wicked, iniquity, you have to think about sin. That's what the definitions are referring to, these words are referring to. Another thing to keep in mind is transgression. Transgression. Now, these words are important because we're going to see other words for sin later on in our Bible, okay? Transgression, so we've seen it's supported by a dictionary so far. So transgression, wickedness, direct violation of God's law, and then also, uh, what else did I say right here? Uh, well, transgression, transgression, wickedness, and then direct violation of God's law, iniquity, iniquity. Notice right here, <clears throat> it is the voluntary neglect 
to obey a positive divine command. So it's just neglecting too. You don't have to do something wrong. Neglecting to do what God told you to do is automatically a sin. So when we say you skip your Bible reading, you skip your prayer, or you skip church, or you skip witnessing to a soul, think about it. That is neglecting what God told you to do. That's automatically sin. A lot of people don't understand uh, sin, really. So these are basic definitions that you want to keep in mind. Now, there are three definitions in the Word of God about sin that you want to keep in mind. We've seen the official definition that is even defined in a dictionary, but there are three definitions. And one is sin is an act. Sin is an act. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Chapter 3, verse 4. The Bible says, Whosoever, notice, committeth sin, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Notice right here, see, it has to do with an act. When you directly violate God's command. Commit a sin, that's an act. So the definition for sin is an act. The breaking of a law or commandment. That's what sin is defined as. Sin is also defined as a state, as a state. Write down Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. So in other words, a baby, we would say, is innocent, correct? But the Bible... Well, <laughs> there we go here. There we go. All right. Fresh start. So <laughs> now we've seen how sin is defined as an act, but a lot of people don't keep in mind that even if you're innocent, even if you didn't do anything wrong, you're still a wicked person. And you might say, well, that ain't fair. That don't make sense. No, you don't know what sin is. This, is, should, this should be a basic. Sin is not just an act. Sin is also your state. So we were all born, see? We were all born from a fallen human nature ever since Adam and Eve sinned. So because of that, their sin passed down upon us. That's why we inherit sin. People don't understand this. Sin is not just an act. Just because you didn't do any sin, see, act. Just because you didn't do any sin doesn't mean that you aren't sin itself. You are sin itself. That's why you do deserve hellfire for eternity. Why? Sin is you. Sin is you. Well, that ain't fair. I don't want that. Then if it's not fair, then why don't you receive Christ for your salvation? That's simple. So that, that way you can be pure. But for you not to do that, see is already a direct violation of God's command. So you committed sin there. A lot of people have a lot of pride. They think they're such good people. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And then the other one we saw as an act is 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. The other one, sin is a... Uh, Sin is a nature. Sin is a nature. So I kind of made a mistake by uh, defining state as nature, so I apologize for that one. But the idea is this, is that for sin is a nature, it's the nature of fallen man at enmity with God. But then sin is a state is referring to his current state because he is without righteousness. Because... If you and I are going to admit it, we're not 100% perfect, right? right? We're not righteous like God, right? So by that very condition or state that you are, you are sin itself. Because the opposite of holiness is sin. That's the idea. And then nature, as I've defined it to you before, that's something where we're all born into. And that is at enmity with God. The nature of fallen man at enmity with God. Because what you and I are born with, so God has to automatically put a blockade there. A block there. That, no, I cannot have you in. See? Now we're going to talk about the origin of sin. The origin of sin. 
The origin of sin is that we can see in two places here. So technically, the first sin that we could see started with Satan. So Isaiah chapter 14, turn to Isaiah chapter 14. And then I want your other hand to go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 14, and then your other hand to go to James 1. Now, Satan, he committed the first sin when he had pride in his heart against God. So that's where sin started. It didn't start with Adam and Eve. It started with Satan. However, what people don't understand is that even though sin started with Satan, we don't blame the devil for it. We have to actually blame ourselves. Satan, he has no one to blame except himself, that means. Because sin starts when you lust in your heart. When you allow that lust to come in, when you allow those things to come inside, and then you listen to that lust. Once that action is committed, that's considered sin. But if that comes in your heart and mind, and then you cast it away, you choose not to do that, then you have not committed sin. We're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 14, and then verse 12, Isaiah chapter 14, and then we'll look at verse 12. If you'll notice right here, what did Lucifer say in his heart? He said that, uh, I will be like the Most High. I will exalt myself above the heights of the clouds, sit on the sides of the north. Notice it was in his heart. Notice that? He said it to himself. So sin starts from where your heart is, from inwardly, and then you yield to it. Let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And then verse 14, James chapter 1 and verse 14. The Bible says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, notice it bringeth forth sin. So you are counted committing the action of sin once you yield to it. See that? Once the heart has something wrong and then you choose to keep contemplating on it, choose to perform its actions, then boom, you've sinned against God. That's how sin originates. So you can't blame God about temptation and sin at verse 13. When, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. You have no one to blame but yourself. The same thing is done through Satan. Now, Romans chapter, the second thing where we can see the origin of sin is that obviously it came through Adam and Eve's disobedience. So write down Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. How sin originated among humanity now, amongst humanity, is because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. If you'll notice right here in this chart, it explains how uh, sin works. And this is a pretty good one about addictions. So a lot of people wonder how they ended up right here. They can't stop. And then it goes like a spiral, and I like what the person wrote down here, a death spiral. So it's pretty much killing your life, and in the end, it will bring you death. So sin is in you. And then what it does is that it hurts you, then Sin symptoms come out, and then you can even get stress out of that. And then a dark habit that you cannot break. You're basically killing yourself. So this chart describes pretty well about how sin operates inside you. Another thing about the origin of sin is Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. The fact of the fall of man. That's the third thing. The fact of the fall of man. In other words, because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, which we already know that's how sin entered, but because of the very fact that they did, 
so we see particular actions that were committed, particular actions that were committed for their fall. That's why sin entered. Because here's the idea. Some people assume that because they ate the fruit, that's how sin entered into the world. That's just one of it. That's what I mentioned previously, but it's only one of it. Notice right here that when you look at verses 1 through 6, it starts out with Satan tempting, and then verse 2 through 3, notice how Eve responds. She doesn't respond faithfully. So notice how sin is originating here. There are certain actions, certain facts here that occurred where sin originated. Then notice right here at verse 4, 5, that uh, the devil lied. Then in verse 6, notice right here, sinful origins before she ate the fruit. It was good for food, lustful to the eyes, pride, tree to be desired to make one wise. Then she ate it. So because of the very facts that we see with the fallen nature of mankind, that's the reason why sin originated. So we, we don't blame Adam and Eve. You have to realize that. You can't just simply blame Adam and Eve. There were certain facts here on why sin was committed. It's more so of in your heart. When you choose that, make that decision, then sin comes out. Okay, now, there are many manifestations of sin that I want you to write down. Now, these will help with the definitions of sin itself. It'll make you uh, contemplate as well uh, more and more. Let's talk about the manifestations of sin now. The manifestations of sin. We see sin entering through Adam's disobedience. And then we saw how sin originated because of certain facts that occurred within the fall. But now let's look at the manifestations of sin. How does sin reveal itself? You ever thought about that? How does sin reveal itself? You might think you know, but when I go through these words, it might be a little bit more sobering to think about. One is transgression. Transgression. Now, don't forget those definitions that I told you earlier, right? So it's going to support the definition here. So one is transgression. What is transgression? Overstepping of the law. So how does sin manifest itself? How does it show? When you overstep God's law. You know what that also means too? If you're zealous to follow God's law, but you overstep it. Out of balance. I don't care if you want to work hard for the church. If you overwork, you got no one to blame but yourself for all the hurt that you've caused to yourself and your family. See, a lot of people don't think about that. They need to go back to ABC, not learn eschatology. The second thing is iniquity. Iniquity, that's how it manifests itself. Oh, by the way, for transgression, it'll be Psalm 51, verse 1. Psalm 51, verse 1. When you look at that verse, you'll notice that the psalmist realized he overstepped God's rules. He overstepped the boundaries. He did his own way. See that? The bottom line of transgression is you do it your own way, not God's way. So even though you think that you're following God's order, what God would want you to do, but if you still do it your own way of doing things, then it doesn't matter that's transgressing against him. Iniquity is the second one, and that's Psalm 51.9. Psalm 51.9. If you'll notice right there, it's an act inherently wrong or forbidden as breaking a commandment. An act that's inherently wrong or forbidden as breaking a commandment. So when you break God's commandment, you have to think about the act that you committed, that it was inherent. Like, you could tell it's totally wrong, it's forbidden. 
And that's what iniquity is defined as. Error, error. That's 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. Error is defined as departure from right. Departure from right. So you've heard about, well, I didn't deliberately sin, or I didn't mess up, but I made a mistake, right? I made a mistake, or I did an accident, or there's a contradiction here. What does that mean? Those are errors. And notice how that is lined up with sin itself. A lot of people don't understand the seriousness of sin, what sin is. They think that it's some kind of deliberate, flagrant, really bad thing you do in your life. The other one is missing the mark. Missing the mark. Now that is high standard there. In other words, it's a failure to meet the divine standard. Already there, then, everyone violated it. And that's Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23. In that verse, sin is defined as just simply falling short of God's perfection. Then it's proven right here, we have definitely sinned against God. The fifth one is trespass. Trespass. And that's intrusion of self-will in God's authority. Intrusion of self-will in God's authority. Now, here's something that you want to pay attention to. And a lot of pastors who think that they're so spiritual and they know better, they've committed trespass. Why? Because what they've done is, in God's authority that was given to them, how dare they put their uh, steps into it and then put themselves in God's authoritative position to do something wrong, and especially influence other people to follow the same wrong. Now that is a heinous, wicked thing. And if you ever wonder why I get mad at pastors, there it is, okay? Because why? If you sin and it's by yourself, that's on you, right? But when you influence people who think that you're doing what God wants you to do, and you teach them wrong doctrine or sin or something like that, you make me stinking angry. How dare you? How dare you? That's all I can say. How dare you? You don't do that to people who look up to your position and who respect your position that, hey, the Lord's using you to speak to me, so that's why I submit to you, listen to you. I mean, you don't take that position lightly. Parents, you take that position lightly? God's given you that authority. And you wonder how children are going to submit to you, listen to you, if they see how your testimony is like. How, well, uh, how much you neglect and staying faithful to what God wants you to do with your spiritual walk, your church duties. Husband, same thing. How can the wife submit to you if your testimony is not that good? If she's serving God more than you, if she's spiritually walking with God, doing more things in the ministry, doing more things than you. Getting quiet in here, right? Yeah, we need to go back to basics. We need to go back to basics. All right, six is lawlessness, lawlessness. I am a truther. I refuse to go by the law and stuff like that. It's just, that it's, then you, are, you sinned, all right? First Timothy 1 9. First Timothy 1 9. That is anarchy. That is anarchy right there. Uh, even worse, not just uh, physical rules here in our life, but even spiritually. There are just rebels who go to church, well, I don't know why you have to dress that way. I don't know why I have to get rid of those things in my home. I don't know why I have to uh, change this in my life. Give me a chapter and verse on that one. You know what they are? Those guys are rebels because they refuse to uh, submit to spiritual standards. The Lord's not going to tell you chapter and verse that this certain TV show is a sin. This certain video game is evil. He's not going to give you chapter and verse on that one. Because he thinks that it's just common sense that you ought to know better. That's uh, so. uh, Here's the easy thing, all right? How many laws do you have in your life, huh? 
Uh, give me chapter and verse, chapter and verse. That sh you know what that proves to me? You have no laws in your life. You never made any rules. It's common sense. Even for lost people, they have their own rules in life. Some moral codes to live by. How, how, how are you doing, huh? Don't worry, I have half an hour left, okay? <laughs> Some of you just came in and you're like, what in the world? <laughs> I thought Pastor Kim was going to talk about, you know, Bayesian probability calculus and quantum mechanics. What is this, you know? You know, you know one thing I learned? One thing I learned is this, God's not going to give you a lesson or a teaching that you, want, you would expect or you would want. No matter what lesson I teach, no one's going to be happy about it. There's going to be some lesson, someday, somewhere out there you're not going to like. Might as well be this one, all right? So sit down and feel uncomfortable for the whole lesson, all right? All right, Matthew chapter 18, verse 27. Matthew 18, 27, debt. Debt. You might say... How is that defined within sin? If you look at that verse, it's pretty telling how you have to owe somebody, how you're in debt, because there's a failure in your duty, things that you neglected, so you have to play catch up. You feel like that sometimes? You have to pay back God? There are things that you neglected that you feel like, man, I'm so falling far behind. Well, it's because of sin. And the, uh, oh, uh, I messed up something right over here. Hold on. Five, six, yeah, seven. Okay, thank you so much. I can't count for a guy who does this calculus stuff, right? All right. So, nope. Uh, let's see here. Come on, erase. All right, seven. And then eight is unbelief. Unbelief. Well, I don't think that God should send me to hell because I'm a good person. I don't get that. Well, if you refuse to receive the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, that alone shows that you sinned against him. I mean, if you're really a good person, why won't you receive him? It's that simple. That's his command. You put your faith on my son, what he did on the cross for you. What, what, what crazy rationale would you try to justify and reason your way around that? That shows me you do have a sin problem if you refuse to believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation. It's unfair that I was born in sin and that I'm going to burn in hell and I never asked for it and blah, 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 blah. Then prove it right now that you will follow God's command, that you don't commit sin. Believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. Amen. You refuse to do that? Then see, it's not. Of course God's fair. Of course God's fair. Because all it takes is just putting your trust on him and he'll wipe your slate clean no matter what sins you commit. That's a very good deal. Amen. I think he's very fair to you. You got no one to blame but yourself for rejecting Jesus Christ. All right, now the next one is the list of sins. The list of sins. This is going to be very important because even though these things should be common sense, there are some people who says, well, how do you know that's a sin? How do you know that's a sin? How do you know that's a sin? You see these people playing smart aleck with you, and then they're saying, well, that ain't a sin, that ain't a sin, blah, 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 blah. You want to know the verses that will actually call out and name specific verses showing you what those sins are, okay? All right, so here are the list of sins. Uh, the verses you want to write down, and the standard is the Ten Commandments, right? When we look at the Ten Commandments, we can see here, obviously, the Ten Simple Rules. And guess what? Our whole nation flunked that. They kicked out the Ten Commandments from school, right? So it shows, it shows me right there, they do have a sin problem. They do have a sin problem. The other one is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. The other one is Romans chapter 1. Uh, don't worry, I'm writing it down, so that way, if I'm too fast, you don't miss out. Romans 1, 9, uh, 29 through 31. Romans 1, 29 to 31. Other one is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. The other one is Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 8. The other one is Galatians chapter 5. Verse 19 through 21. And then the last one is Mark chapter 7, verse 20 through 23. 
These are the best passages. All right, I'm going to switch screens soon, so write it down now. But these are the best passages that you want to write down if you want to find the specific sin in there that you're trying to condemn and trying to show your loved one. It lists so many different sins. A best place to start is right here. Even Ray Comfort starts out with this one, the Ten Commandments, to prove everyone's sin sometime in their life. And guess what? 100% of the time, everyone already broke this. Now, if they broke 10 simple rules, how much more with this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this? You know what the total comes down to? A total of over 50 different sins with different variations of each one. That's what this, these, all these verses will show you. All these verses will show you over 50 sins, including the same sins mentioned that are varied, that people never thought about before. These are the best passages to prove it. And you think you're good enough to go to heaven after that, that you're not wicked? Wicked. Wicked. If you broke five rules in this country, they are going to be suspicious of you. But if you've done like 10, 10 of these in one day and every day, don't tell me that you're a good person and you can go to heaven after that. These are very good uh, verses. And you'll notice right here, uh, this is a really good one. Notice how many sins are listed here. Uh, oop, sorry. I didn't switch screens here. Uh, da, da, da. There we go. See that? He goes from A to B to C to D, E, F. See, that's a lot right there. He goes in alphabetical order. And by the way, he gives you New Testament as well. And he gives you in the New Testament the list of sins here. So notice all these sins that are mentioned. No one is clean. No one is good enough to go to heaven. But these have a lot of lists here where people might say, how do you know that's wrong? How do you know that's wrong? Well, that thing we'll mention right there. I mean, some of them, you never thought about it. Here's, uh, here's one example is uh, being effeminate. So when guys kind of get a little bit girly, you got to realize that is a sin. Oh, man, I, you call that sin. You th you're just so macho. You think that guy's got to be so macho and stuff like that. Yeah, they got to be a man. I'm not saying, you know, like that all the time, but you, ha you have to be a man because you're a man. But when you do uh, woman things or girly things, that's out of God's norm of what he created you to be. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Wow, I didn't know that was sin. I thought you were so fundamental. I thought you were too legalistic. No, because it's scripture. I'll tell you why you never thought about that. You don't take sin seriously, do you? You know what D.L. Moody once said, which was really good? I'd rather, uh, I'd rather, uh, uh, what did he say? Uh, I'd rather be uh, too... I'd rather, it's safer to be too careful with sin than being too liberal with it. Okay. That's good. He said, if I had one or the other, I'd choose to be the careful one. Now we're going to uh, look at Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23. The Bible shows that sin cannot be hidden. Sin cannot be hidden. So here's the ugly part. And people think that it's hidden. It's put behind them. It's not a big deal. No. What you need to learn in this lesson of sin so that you can have some fear in your life and a healthy fear, not an unhealthy fear, but a healthy fear. People should have some sort of fear in their lives. And that is be sure your sin will find you out. Listen, I don't care how long you try to hide it, but the Bible says that sin cannot be hidden. Why do you think that I try to repent every single time? Get right with God. You know why? Because it is certain, 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 okay, guaranteed. Keep that in mind, okay? Certain, 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 
that your sin will be found out. You might hide it pretty good all this time, but trust me, one day it's going to come out of the closet because homosexuals did the same thing too. One day it will come out of the closet. No matter how well you try to hide it behind your tie and your suit and, you know, your smile and your spirituality, that ugly sin behind it will come out. Certain. That's what God promised. That's the reason why I repent daily. Numbers chapter 32. Very quiet here. We must have a, a lot of closets in here. All right. Numbers chapter 32. I told you it would be a very uncomfortable lesson. Chapter 32, verse 23. But if you will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure. See, the verse is saying, make sure that you know that this is a guarantee. Your sin will find you out. Not a popular verse. Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28. If I was one of those modern version translators, I'd change that word. I'd change that word. What an ugly verse. Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. It is also certain, not just your sin being found out, but the sinner will be found out. Oh, that's not fun. It is also certain that the sinner will also be found out. Why? Because you committed the act, and then just because the act is exposed doesn't mean that you won't get exposed. All right, Proverbs chapter 28, and then verse 13. The Bible reads here, He that covereth his sins shall what? Not prosper. Good luck. See, it's the person too. Your sin will be uncovered, and you, by name, by name, will be uncovered. But, thank God for the but, amen. But whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall have mercy. That's why God's been merciful to you all this time. You must have repented. If I were you, I'd repent several times a day. Amen? All right, the other one is Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Sins cannot be hidden. And then the other one you want to know is death from sin. Death from sin. Now, when you commit sin against God, you don't go unscathed. You do have to face a punishment. So, we all know this, if I commit sin in my body, then I'm going to have to pay the penalty one day. And that's why everyone dies. See that? I don't care, innocent or not innocent, everyone dies, correct? That's why everyone dies, because God thinks everybody sinned. We have to understand that. All right, so let's go to... Uh, Genesis chapter 3, you consist of body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. I don't know how much you can see that, so I apologize. But basically right here, with body, soul, and spirit, we have to see how death operates. When you die, you go right here, the grave. The grave. Uh, then it'll cut off half of the chart. That's the problem. Okay, then, I'll just do this. I'll just do this. I'll, I'll concentrate from bottom and then, keep, and then go to work my way to the top, okay? All right, then. So you go to the grave because when your body commits sin, it's going to take its toll one day because your body was, remember, born with a sinful nature, right? So it has to pay the price and death will come. Genesis chapter 3. And then verse 17, the Bible says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. So the ground is cursed. And when you compare that with verse 19, a cursed ground is the appropriate place for your body, your cursed body of sin goes into. So verse 19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So that's an appropriate place for your body. Psalm 104, Psalm 104, verse 29. Psalm chapter 104 and verse 29. Notice that we all die physically. So the first death is physical death. 
physical death. Our body is born with a, again, sinful human nature. So it has to decease. Uh, it has to cease. It has to cease. Psalm 104, verse 29, to the dust of the earth. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and then I want your other hand to go to 1 Peter 3, Ephesians 2 and 1 Peter chapter 3. The spiritual death, spirit, spiritual death, spirit. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, and 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. So, because you sinned against God, you actually are not going to any of these places here. The place that you're going is actually here. Oh, uh, come on. So, wh what do you mean by that, Pastor? That's the earth, isn't it? Correct. You're on the earth. So right now, you're a walking dead man. As you're walking on this earth, you're already dead. Why? Because your spirit is dead. Once you were born with a sinful nature, your spirit is dead. So the evidence is given at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5. The Bible says, even when we were, what? Dead in sins. This is before our salvation. Hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. So quickened means made alive. Okay, so if you are made alive when you got saved, and being saved is spiritual, right? That's a salvation that's spiritual, correct? So if you were made alive when you got saved, then that means you were dead before. So then what died? What died? It would make sense it's spirit because we're talking about spiritual salvation that made you alive. So that means that your spirit was the one that died. If we go to 1 Peter 3, verse 18, the Bible says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he, must, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but what? Quickened by the what? Spirit. The spirit is what makes alive. Why would the Holy Spirit... Do a spiritual thing in you to make you alive if it's not something spiritual in you that died. So that makes sense about the spiritual death. The last death is eternal. Go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. The last death is eternal death. Your body goes to the grave. You, your death is here walking on this earth. And then you face an eternal death and that's going down here in hell. And we can obviously know that this is referring to the soul. So the soul is the one that's left, and that's where it burns in hell for all eternity. Body, soul, and spirit must pay the price of death because sin infected everything of you. Everything of you. Revelation 21, verse 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars. So there's a list of sins already. So you can even just use that verse. Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the what? So notice right here, it is called death, this eternal hell fire. And that's also known as the second death. Now I want you to go to 1 John uh, 5. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Now, most people, when you ask them if they sin before, they're all going to admit that they've sinned. But believe it or not, we live in a day and age where people think that they didn't sin. There are those who think that they are sinlessly perfect, which is hilarious, but there are some safe Christians who think like that, which is nuts, and they think that they never sinned. So here's the thing that you want to point out to them or that they did not sin today. That's what they might say. These are the standard verses that you want to use and you want to write down. These are the best verses when you're trying to argue that, no, you did sin against God, and they're like, no, I didn't sin. No, 
uh, I'm okay. I think that I can go to heaven. No, the Bible says that sin affected everyone. Everyone. I don't care who you are. You are a sinner and you did sin. And you might say, I don't think so. Well, let me prove it to you here. These, are the, uh, these verses might surprise you. And by the way, you might do more for the Lord after looking at these verses. Because you never knew how sin is defined before. So these are the standard verses to prove that sin affected everyone. Look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. And we will look at verse 17. The Bible says, all unrighteousness. All right, have you done something that was not considered righteous? Think about that. Before you sit down and look at the screen, is that righteous? When you're talking to someone in fellowship, I don't care if it's not wrong, you know, is it righteous? Or, you know, when you have a disagreement or fight with the spouse or in the family, I don't care if you didn't sin or you're not the one committing wrong. Is it righteous what you're doing? If it's not righteous, the Bible says all unrighteousness is what? Oh, my goodness. That should cover it. But if that don't cover it, Romans 14. Romans chapter 14. Man, you'd be surprised how many, of, uh, how many verses that you violated. <laughs> there is no doubt everyone sinned. The best verses to prove that the person sinned and you can show it to that person are these verses that you want to write down. If, if you're going to talk to someone, you can't just say, Pastor Kim, uh, I forgot the verses. Can you tell me? No, no. That's what you got Sunday school for. That's why you're coming here. Put it to good use. Write it down. Memorize them. Bookmark them. I don't care what you do with them, but just keep use them for later. Romans 14, verse 23. Notice right here that uh, the last part of the verse is that whatsoever is not a faith is what? Sin. Sin. Should I uh, put on that garment before I go to church? Is this the decision I should make in the future? I'll just do it. You know what? That is sin. Because you don't have faith in it. If you're doing anything that without faith, not a faith, then you're sinning. Oh, amen, amen. You know, that's actually a good verse because if you're coming here to church and serving God, but you don't have faith in what you're going through or through the trials in life, you got to realize God does not want that for you. That's unhealthy. That's stressful. He wants you to believe what you're doing is right and that he'll take care of you. If you live your life in uncertainty, you're sinning. So that actually should be a positive thing. All right, another one is Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23. And you know that verse. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So automatically, that verse should be strong enough that, hey, are you 100% perfect like God? If the person says, no, I'm not, then automatically you've proven then you're a sinner. So that is probably the strongest verse. The strongest verse is that one. The other one is 1 John 1.10. 1 John 1.10. All right, here's a really good one. Now, let's just say that the person says, well, I didn't sin. Then you know what the Bible calls him? The Bible calls him a liar and that you are a sinner. <laughs> That's strong. I didn't say that. The Bible said that. If you say you didn't sin, then the Bible says that you are a liar and you've automatically sinned, right? Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a what? Liar. <laughs> so if the person says, oh, I didn't sin, then you tell him you're a liar. That's what the Bible calls you. And the, what did the Bible say in Revelation 21, verse 8, that we saw before? All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. Powerful, ain't it? The Bible is rock solid. There's no escape in it. Now, the other one is James 2.10. James 2.10. And the Bible points out, so write them down. We're, we don't have time to look at all of them. But in James 2.10... If there is something you know that's supposed to be good for the Lord, but you don't do it, the Bible says you sinned. So let me ask you this. Is it good to play an instrument over here? Yeah, that's a good thing, right? 
If you don't do it, the Bible says sin. Is it a good thing to encourage somebody here in that room? Let them know that you're praying for them. All right, if you don't do it, that's sin. Is it a good thing to bring food over there? Is it a good thing to come to church? Is it a good thing to make sure that your family's in order? Is it a good thing to do this extra thing for the Lord? If you don't do it, oh, I understand. No, God don't say that. Sin. That's strong. That's strong. People don't understand righteousness or sin. All right, then. Romans uh, 3.12 is another passage. Romans 3.12 is another passage. And then Galatians 3.22 is another passage. But anyway, you can look at those things in your spare time. Those verses are so powerful, proving once and for all that everyone has sinned against God. Now, the last one, I want you to go to Ephesians 1 and 1 John 1. Let's close it off here. Ephesians chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 1. Ephesians 1 and 1 John chapter 1. Let's close it off with what we're all dying and waiting for. When you study sin, it's not all about doom and gloom. God's not going to leave you like that. What God wants to do is provide you a remedy. Praise the Lord. He wants to provide you a solution out of it. He's not just going to leave you with bad news. And too late, I can't do anything about it. What am I going to do? So God's not going to leave you like that. He is going to leave you a solution. And here's the solution. You know what's the solution? You know what the solution is, my friend, to all that thing that you messed up today? What can wash away my sin? Tell me. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, absolutely nothing except his blood. That's why he died. You need that blood to just wash it, to cleanse it. So the blood of Jesus Christ is necessary. That's what saved our soul. So then that's why we can go sinless into heaven. And that's also the thing that can wash away the sins we commit daily in our body so that we don't have to have a guilty consequence about it. So the blood of Jesus Christ, you can see that chart, lots of good stuff, what the blood does and what the blood can do. It has such power. You don't belittle the power of the blood. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. The Bible points out here that the blood is the very reason that the sins can be washed away, and then we, that's why you have to plead the blood. You have to ask for forgiveness. The Bible says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the what? Forgiveness of sins, according, to, I like this one, according to the riches of his grace. He's rich to forgive as much as you're rich to sin. Bless God, amen. So that's why you need to, when you repent, you need to confess your sin and say, God, I'm sorry. And you need to mean it, obviously. You can't just do it like a ritual, you know. There are, unfortunately, Catholics who just do the confession, but then they have the very intention to do it as soon as it's over. So I'm not talking about that. You got to mean it. So when you confess your sin, you don't do it to a priest. You do it to God himself. Because God is the only one who's got the power. He's got the blood to wash away your sin. No man on earth can do it. If you do it to me, I am going to reject you. I'm going to turn you down flat and point you to the one who can actually wash away your sin. 1 John chapter 1, your hands there, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So notice right here, this is about Christian walk, Christian fellowship, not just salvation. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, what? Cleanseth us from all sins. During your fellowship, your walk, that blood still has the power to wipe it clean. So have you been pleading it? Have you been confessing your sin? Asking for the blood? Verse 9, verse 9. And my question to you is, why not? If we confess our sins, see that? That's why it's important you do that. He is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember, the blood is the forgiveness of sins. The blood is a cleansing agent. So how often have you confessed? How often have you asked for the blood 
to wash it away. If I were you, now would be a great time. Now would be a great time. You don't have to do it on an altar call. That would even be a great time. All right, plead the blood. It's the only thing that can wash away your sins. That is the only remedy for your sin. So we conclude our teaching on sin. I hope you learned a lot. It's not basic, but a much learning and sobering lesson and that you can apply it in your life. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers, open our eyes more about sin, about how we live our lives and what we should practice, what we should do, and how it gives us greater understanding on why you take sin seriously, why sin is so evil, why sin should be preached against, why we should have our own moral codes according to your will, why that must be developed. Help us to have a higher standard against sin. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.